that means a firm ruling. There are rulings in the Quran. There's basic logic, basic instruction that represent the law that Muslims are to follow if they accept this book into their conscious lives. And there's no ambiguity in those laws. When Allah says, this is the point I'm making and this is the way and this is the way that you have to carry this out, then it's not for us to misconstrue it or to change it or to add to it or to try to take from it. We don't add and subtract from what Allah has laid down firmly as rules of law and logic in the Quran. That's the first thing. If Allah says, do not go near zina, do not go near fornication and adultery, then there's no other way of us trying to formulate that or fashion that so that we can do it our way. Allah is the best of knowers. Allah is the best of planners. And we go with what Allah says when he has laid it down unequivocally in the Quran. <coughs> and Allah says that other verses or ayat are allegorical or do carry ambiguous import, meaning that we're not quite sure or that we can interpret it in various ways. There's much in the Quran that can be that can be interpreted in various ways, various modes of understanding and enlightenment come out of one verse. So scholars in the history of our religion have uh, understood this and have accepted that there are multiple definitions or multiple ways of viewing particular ayat in the Quran. There's both. There is that which there is no argument about or no uh, differences to bring up or to, <laughs> to speculate about. And then there is that which is uh, also carrying the opportunity for various ways of looking at it, various interpretations. Allah says, continuing, but those in <coughs> whose hearts, kulubihim, those in whose hearts is deviation. They follow the part that is allegorical, seeking discord and searching for its hidden meanings, those beneath the surface meanings. <clears throat> but no one knows its hidden meanings except Allah. And there are some who would read this and put a period there, and there are others who would read this and continue into the next part of the sentence. That's what we mean by various kinds of ways of looking at a particular verse. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, we have been told by our leadership that the very fact that Allah gifted people in the Quran, such as Yusuf, salam, with the ability to uh, understand Allah's ta'weed, is saying that Allah, yes, he has that knowledge for himself, but he has allowed human beings from time to time to also come into that kind of understanding. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, the rasikun, a rasikun. Now rasikun, when you think of firmly grounded, think about the terms that these uh, scholars are using to interpret or to translate these Arabic words into English. Firmly grounded suggests plant life. Plant life. And this word rasikun is related to the idea of something uh, being mature as a tree grows to be mature or a plant grows to be mature and also that which can absorb just as the roots of a tree absorb water, absorb sunlight, absorb oxygen in order to continue upon the life plan that Allah set for them. So we want to think about these words in their fullest application and uh, Hopefully, with the help of Allah, we can get a much better understanding once we understand the fitrah evolution of these words in our language. Continuing, those people, those who are rooted in knowledge, those who are receiving the nutrient of the knowledge, they say, we believe in the book, the whole of it is from our Lord. So Muslims are not supposed to differentiate between what's in what one part of the Qur'an and what happens to be in another part of the Qur'an. 
Muslims are to accept Allah's word from El Fatiha to An Nas. Even if we don't understand all of the ramifications and all of the context that we find while reading the Quran. There's going to be much that we come across in the Quran that we have no clue, have no idea. But we still have to accept it as Allah's revelation and accept it as being just as valid and significant as everything else that we read in the Quran that we think we do understand. Right? We have to uh, see the Quran as being a cohesive whole in terms of, it, of its information and not differentiate because we don't understand the thing. And we're not to get caught up into all of these mysteries that people bring before us. You know, what, what does this mean, Imam? What does, uh, you know, the man walking with Musa, I mean, you know, what does his, what does his walking stick mean? You know, what does the rain mean, Imam? You know, but while, it's, while he's trying to make it rain, he ain't making no salat. You know, while he's, while he's trying to figure out the three levels of the naps, you know, he ain't thinking about fasting Ramadan. He's just thinking about all the mystery and how he can continue to mystify the minds of the people and also, in a very surreptitious way, lead the people away from the real goal. Because the real goal in Al-Islam is to understand the basics first. Is to understand how to situate your human life upon the basic foundation of this deen. Deen itself alludes to the idea of that which is fundamental. You know, in English, they just took it and, and they called it down. You know, in Arabic, in Arabic, we just call it deen. In English, they call it dawn. You know, see, these are consonantally connected languages, even though they are different in separate languages. It only means that this is supposed to situate you upon the base dunya from the same idea. It's supposed to situate you upon the basic foundation upon you are to then build your human life. But if people take you and put your fundamental life in the sky and they make it difficult for you to reach it and you only can reach it through them. And believe me, this is what most major religions in the world have done, have been accused of and have actually done. That you could not understand that religion in some religions, you couldn't even read the book. In, in uh, historical Christianity, you weren't allowed to read the Bible. Only the minister, the preacher, or the priest was allowed to read the Bible. They had to tell you what was in the Bible, and you just had to take their word for it because you couldn't read Latin. And all of the Bibles back then were written mostly in Latin. If not all of them, most of them. In the early history of the Roman Catholic Church. So it was only recently that... Adherents to these various faith groups were allowed to actually read their scriptures. <clears throat> so I'm bringing you all of this background information so that we'll know how to deal more effectively with the information of the Quran or the knowledge of the Quran and the life example that we're supposed to be living as Muslims. Emulating the character, the spirit, the works, the attitude, the emotion even of our Prophet Muhammad, praise be. But we have to learn how to do that, and we have to learn how to see it in its 7th century context. But be able to remove it from its 7th century context and put it in 21st century reality. Some of us have picked up the sunnah, and we picked up the 7th century reality and tried to import 7th century behavior and ideas and thinking into 21st century America. Now, I'm not suggesting that we change anything. I'm suggesting that what Muhammad left us, and definitely what the Quran leaves us, or gives us as guidance, is, is timeless. The Quran is not a 7th century idea. The Quran carries with it Petra-based ideas. Ideas that are based in the very natural order as Allah created it. And it has no timeline. It has no uh, cutoff for what's appropriate in terms of you practicing it. It was good 1400 or so years ago when it was revealed to Muhammad. And it's even better now. Because there's more knowledge in the world now. 
There's more science in the world now. There's more information in the world to substantiate all of the wonderful things that Allah has established in various fields of knowledge. <coughs> when it was revealed in the 7th century, we didn't have all this proof. There were no planes flying in the sky and all of these other things. They didn't know that the air was thinner up there yeah, in, that, in that atmosphere. They didn't know about all of these things that the Quran brought to the world's attention. But we know it now, so we should be even sure in our conviction when practicing and teaching this deen. <clears throat> so ending that verse, we believe in the whole of it, we believe in the book, all of it is from Allah, and none is the message, I want to believe it, that none will grasp this message except the people, they say people, they say men of understanding, but we want to correct that. This is not just males or men that Allah is referring to. Ulu that bad represents people of sound thinking, people of sound mind. So this is not for those who are, who are, who are shaky minded. This is not for those who are flippant or back and forth with what it is they believe. One day they're Muslims, the next day they want to be five percent, the next day they're Rastas. When I say day, I mean you know a period of time passes and you see the brother again or the sister again, and she's into something else. And Mike still says she's Muslim, but she's adopted some other cultural flag. Huh? Some other ideology to support what she feels is not being supported by the religion. When they're not understanding that if you understand this religion practically, you will also see that this religion covers every single necessary aspect of human involvement, human life and human involvement. In fact, this religion is the religion that keeps you in your true human form. This is a religion that is not sold to the masses of people by Allah and His Messenger, present peace be upon Him, as a cultural flag. This is not an Arab religion. This is not an Arab invention. And although our prophet was from the Arab people, from the Quraysh, the tribe of Quraysh, much of what he had to say got on the nerves of most of Quraysh. Which right there should prove to you that this is not a Quraysh-y invention. It got on the nerves of the Arabs. Allah speaks about that in his Quran. And says to them not to fathom themselves as believers when faith has not yet entered their hearts. They had Islam as a basic idea or ideology, but they had not yet let that uh, knowledge seep into the core of their being. So that it became something that transcended race, transcended ethnicity, transcended geography. This is our deen. It represents the template that human beings all over the world need for evolving themselves to the level of human that Allah will be pleased with. So. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Wa baraka Allah Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama baraka ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fi alami innaka Hamid. So we're talking about that which will help situate us in the modern world, especially the Western world here in America, where most of us are now uh, gathering and situating ourselves. We call it America, but that's really not fair because there are two Americas. There's North America and South America, and I think we just kind of ganked the term America and just made it kind of general. Really, we're talking about most of the activities that happen in North America. <coughs> Not necessarily in South America. We need to have our eyes on South America. And actually, Muslims need to have their eyes on every part of the planet right now. 
especially those parts of the planet that are experiencing turmoil. We're sitting in our living rooms or playing in our backyards with our barbecue set, not realizing that something very tremendous is happening on Earth right now. If you're talking about upheavals and earthquakes, they're happening on the moral, the mental, the spiritual level as we sit and barbecue our, our, our chicken breasts. They're happening all around us. Things are happening in parts of the world whose names we never even knew until we saw it on television. Some of us never heard of these places, but they're having war, turmoil, strife, killings, injustice, all of the things that, especially here in America, African Americans used to accuse white folks of doing to us. I have to look at it like that. You know? So what it is saying is that because many of the people around the world are experiencing the very same thing, it's racism, ethnic cleansing, they just have different names for it. <coughs> the sacrificing of children. I mean the literal blood sacrificing of children. In crazy rituals. Believing that this is going to give people the power of youth again. And you have people sometimes in high places, people whose names you would know, who are exercising these kinds of demonic demonstrations of madness. And the world just can't take it anymore. Allah is allowing things to happen in this world, I believe, so that we as Muslims in America in a so-called free society will eventually wake up and realize that it's going to be our responsibility to solve many of these problems and these equations in the world. But we ourselves don't see ourselves in a position to do that because we're still too busy with the distractions that this world provides. And I want to talk to you about distractions because that's the number one enemy of Muslims and right-minded people in the 21st century. The world is now ripe for leadership. The world is ripe for the discipline and the guidance that the Quran brings. But the conveyors of that information are not ready. That would be you and me, on the most part. The conveyors of that message are not ready. Because they have us bogged down in rituals with no understanding and in playtime and vain talk. I look at what some Muslims have to say on Facebook and I'm appalled. Appalled. I said, is this person just carrying the name such and such? Where is the strategy for putting some words into the public that when people who are not familiar with your life style will say, man, this is, this is different. This is intelligent. But I'm starting to see even Muslims, I'm guessing they're Muslims, post that which is virtually pornographic. Now they might take it from a non-Muslim source, but why are you posting this? Why are you bringing this before the eyes of all the people that you know? To say what? Vanity and vain talk. If we're doing that, we're not accepting the whole of the book because the whole of the book, within the book, there are things that preach directly against that, or I should say teach directly against that. And therefore, we are not of the rasifun, or rasifun. What does Allah mean by the pure mind, the pure thinkers? If you think about the intellect of the infant, when the infant arrives here from the womb of his mother, where it's not inundated with a whole lot of stuff that it has accumulated being on the planet for a few years. That newborn knows virtually nothing about this particular existence, but look at how much beauty comes out of that infant. Look at how much, uh, uh, it seems to be scientific evaluation of things that come out of the face of that infant. 
That infant is not a foolish creature. And I've heard even my mom say on many occasions, it's the adults that make the infant silly. The baby doesn't come here silly. The baby comes here a virtual scientist. Studying things, looking at his hand, wondering what that is. Feeling his mother's face to see what that is. Smiling when it's pleased with what it sees or what it feels. Comfortable in a world that gives it comfort and love and shows it mercy. Allah has clocked that into the nature of that child, even while in the womb of its mother. It's shown mercy, so it's used to mercy. It's shown love through the umbilical cord. So it's used to love. And when it begins to receive those things that they are that are the antithesis of that, it, it protests. That's intelligent life that Allah blessed to be on this planet. When that child hears a loud noise that it can't, and it can't identify loud, it didn't experience loud noises within the womb of its mother. That child begins to protest. When that child gets on a dirty diaper, there's no dirty diaper in the gestation period within the mother. There's no dirty diaper. That baby relieves itself and it goes right into the system and Allah moves it right out. No time for it to accumulate. And when that, day, when that diaper gets full in this life, that baby will cry out until a responsible adult comes to its rescue. And all of us know that this is the case, especially those of us who have raised children. But this world has given us distortions, and they have brought us into a situation in this 20th and 21st century that is designed to have us accept these distractions wholeheartedly. So instead of it, uh, accepting the Qur'an and say that the whole of it is from Allah, most of us are now beginning to accept most or much or maybe everything that the culture is bringing to us. And we're calling ourselves Muslims. We're more into sports and entertainment than we are into the Qur'an. Say what you want about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was firmly against what he called sport and play. Because he understood that it took the mind of the individual off of the track that God would have that mind placed on. And you begin to live what is called a precarious life. And Imam Muhammad brought us this logic. A precarious life. What is that? It's a second-handed life. It's not your primary life that most of us are living. Most of us, even Muslims, are living a second-hand life. We're living the life of someone that we want to be it's like reading about a character in a book and you get absorbed into the characteristics of that character. And you begin to go out and I can tell you in popular culture, for those of us who grew up as 70s children, which I was one of, I remember these images that were placed into the African American thinking sphere. Through the movies, through the music, even more so through the music now, but then through the movies, like you would remember Superfly. <laughs> You would remember the map. When they were using media and movies to sell African American men on the most part, the idea that being a pimp was a good thing. You could even beat the Coco for being a pimp. Superfly got away. But it was selling us a false idea of what a human being is supposed to be. A human being is not supposed to be a super fly. Yeah, you know what a fly likes to hang around on and land on. <laughs> and if you can imagine a super one, then you got the idea of what they were trying to sell us during the 70s, during the 80s, and so forth. And they're doing the same thing now through modern day hip hop and other sources of so-called uh, entertainment. And they wanted to bring our community down to the dog level, so they started giving us these so-called stars who were named after dogs, Snoop Dogg. Little Bow Wow. And I can name about three or four others. Named after dogs. Because they wanted to bring the mentality. They wanted us to begin to emulate and imitate those lower forms of life so that we will never recognize the true life that they knew was coming through the message of the Quran and the life example taught of Prophet Muhammad by those excellent purveyors of this deen in this day and time. They know that there are minds among us, scholars among us, and common people like ourselves 
in society who are chomping at the bit wanting to introduce this dean in his pure form and as something that they express through their behavior more than they express through their words. They know that you are sitting and waiting for that opportunity. And you're taking every advantage of that opportunity at your workplace, in the schools, in the colleges. Some of you are operating even in the lower grades, high schools, and some of our elementary school students who might be sharing a classroom with a non-Muslim are, are so happy about this thing and so natural in it and feel so good in it that they find ways to establish that logic even among their friends and they are the leaders of little packs of groups in school but they are academic leaders in elementary school from Muslims like you and I and our children. And that's a wonderful thing. We need to understand that. But the majority of us are not on that sabir. We are not on that road. The majority of us are on the road that leads to the personification of all kinds of crazy things that Allah abhors, that Allah hates. And I can imagine many of us returning to our Lord, may we not be among any of these people. And Allah says, you know, I'm just thinking out loud now. I'm not going to judge you when you never existed. You thought you were Jay-Z. Little girl, you thought you were Beyonce. And most of what you did during your every given moment on earth was an emulation of Beyonce. So how can I judge you? You never lived. Imagine that one. Only a law can figure that one out. You know, it's like the guy who's brought to court, charged with a crime, and his lawyer trying to defend him by saying, well, he didn't know what he was doing. He was out of his mind. He thought he was <laughs> Al Capone. The judge has to consider that. Well, he thought he didn't have to prove to me that he thought he was out of court. But the point is, we have to get our Muslim life back. We have to return to the purity of intellect that that infant has, where there's no vanity. There's no vanity in that infant. There's no ego issue for that newborn. That newborn is showing pure love and the pure ability in its learning capacity to engage creation and to build upon that engagement. So we need a whole new paradigm for how we see Al-Islam, for how we see this deen, for how we see the example of Muhammad. We need a whole other paradigm for how we operate. Because a person should be able to see that you're a man or woman of faith even before they hear what comes out of your mouth. Now, if they hear something out of your mouth that sounds like religion, but they're looking at your behavior and reading your words that sound like kufr, that sound like shirk, then we need to reevaluate what our position is. I'm just talking to individuals. We need to reevaluate what our position is vis a vis this religion, this deen, and how it is working for us. We have a tremendous opportunity in front of us in this last moment. A tremendous opportunity, especially in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know, sometimes they say you can't see yourself because you can be too close to the light sometimes. And it blinds you. But people outside, they say, man, I wish I could have just uproot and move to Philly right now. Philly got it going on. This is what a lot of people around the country, a lot of the Muslims around the country, this is what they want for their community. They want this kind of achievement, this kind of success. But if you don't recognize it on the level that it really, really represents for you, then what will happen is that Allah will set it. And people will think, we've achieved. We've arrived. Hey, we got it. So I don't have to give any more sadaqah. No more zakat for me. We got all that we need. I don't have to make friends with people outside of here. No more interfaith relations for me. We got what we were looking for. This is like the big church. This is like the big synagogue. So we, we've arrived. So we don't need their synagogue. We don't need to be hanging out in their church. We, that, they got to come to us. See, that's the beginning of what I call the Iblesian ideology. That's the beginning of Iblis creeping up on us. 
When we begin to think that we're self-sufficient, we don't need anything outside of us, Allah shows us an opportunity to grow based on something else that he's bringing in the picture, and we look at it and reject it and say, I'm better than that. I don't need that. See, once we come into our real mind that Allah, I believe, is creating here in this land of North America, among people, most of whom look like you and me, I'm talking about Muslims, and I'm talking, I have to say this since I'm in front of you, most of you who are of the African-American experience. And then I'm going to narrow it down a little more. Those of you who are from the African-American Muslim experience, who many of you came through the Nation of Islam. You got Imam Siraj Mahaj and others who are teaching this now more than we are representing. They're telling you, you are going nowhere. They're telling the immigrant community, the so-called foreign Muslims. They say, you're not going anywhere until you Understand the history, the development, and the course that Muslim African Americans have been on years before you arrived here in droves. Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh, Hamza, a lot of them are teaching like this now. Numa, Ali Khan, all these uh, scholars that we respect outside of our African American experience, with the exception of the Mansur he's from our history. But they are telling us now. We are going nowhere. You can sit here and build masjid, masjid and, and be happy and do Ramadan and go to Hajj. But you're really just participating in ritual life. The real life is when you take the teachings and the practices of our prophet, prayers and peace be upon him, and make them practical in the life of the society. So if you're living on a block, for instance, and there's drugs, there's crime, there's all of these other things, you, you fear for your wife and your daughter when they come home at night. <clears throat> Don't you know that what happened in the nation of Islam is the solution to that? You don't have to accept the shirk. And it was unconscious shirk on the part of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He didn't do that consciously. He was taught that by one of those who I'm addressing right now. He didn't make that up. Man went to the third grade elementary school and met a mystic from a foreign land who told him all those things and made all of those weird connections in religion. He had no clue. He wasn't a scholar. He was a homeboy. He was a homeboy. So what I'm saying is, you don't always have to accept the whole picture of what somebody presents to you in order to, to gain value out of some of the information that you might be lacking. And Muslims, generally speaking, are lacking the ability to know what to do in their very communities that will make and keep those communities safe and sound. We don't know what to do. I'm looking at all of these notices, especially in Philadelphia. Muslim children disappear. <laughs> kidnapped Muslims have you seen this child Pima most of them female have you seen this child six years old beautiful little girl snatched just disappeared and I've been on a daily and weekly basis now don't you know back in the nation of Islam days they, they would have found out what that was by now <laughs> and that's a charge against those of us who are in the nation of Islam because we ain't on our, 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 our thing like we used to be. But we're older now. And, but the, our mistake is that we haven't passed this information down to our young generations. So as we begin to grow, dear Muslims, in our conclusion, we have to have a separate effort. And this is to all Muslims. I'm not saying all of what I said to separate groups of Muslims. If we do that, then we're guilty of one of the most heinous crimes that can be committed by Muslims if we try to separate and say W.D. Muhammad's group is everybody got to just go over there and follow that. Or check this one, you got to run over there and follow that. Most of us don't know half of what most of these great teachers taught because we don't study like that. We accept what the majority of people in the world accept. Group mentality. Herd mentality. Which way is the majority going? Okay, that's the way I'm going. Even if that way is to the slaughterhouse. 
That's what I mean by precarious thinking, second-handed thinking. He's doing it. That's what she does. That's where I am. You have to figure this thing out for yourself. Read the Quran for yourself. Evaluate the life of Muhammad sallam, for yourself and for your family because Allah is going to charge you with whether or not you made an attempt to save yourself and your family from the fire whose fuel is men and stones. That's all we have time for. Inshallah, we will be doing a ta'aleem, a short ta'aleem, about an hour from now after the Surah al -Asr. And inshallah, if you can stay or go and come back, we'll see you then. We'll uh, complete this thought in greater detail, inshallah. I pray that I have not said anything <coughs> offensive to anyone that they see as offensive. <clears throat> and I pray that I've only been uh, <coughs> one to provide to you information, even though it might sound harsh or it might uh, rub you the wrong way for a minute. That's the other thing that Muslims have to get over in the 21st century. Ego issues. <laughs> and ethnic ego issues. Going to achieve the level of human that Allah points out for us in the Quran. And I'm talking about that one that Allah has called Al Insan. That was taught, that Allah taught by the Quran. So 55, right? Al Rahman. Ilam al Quran. Ilam al Insan. You want to be that human being? You better learn to get over ego issues and emotional stuff. You know, I, I was hurt. The world doesn't have time for us to be hurt and linger on that for months and years. We have to do like Imam Muhammad instructed us. And that is work with your brother and sister. And if you don't like something, he said, bite your lip till it bleeds. Don't just be quick to say negative things about people. Oh, you don't like a thing, you didn't support a thing, you're going to tell everybody else not to support that thing. That's not right. Just hold your tongue, hold yourself tongue. You don't know who that, what that person might bring for the future. Yelling at all our children. We don't know what the potential is. Which one of these children are going to come along and be the next multi-millionaire to take this community economically to where it needs to be? We don't know these things. So respect life. Especially Muslim life. Huh? That person next to you before you leave, you should make sure that you know at least their name. I bet you most people here don't. Come here every week, sit next to the same person and still don't know their name. Or his name. Don't say anything to the children. Just let them run wild. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, good to see you here. How long you been a part of this match? You should just be saying that to the seven-year-old. Make them feel like they're part of this Muslim experience. Because Philadelphia, in fact, is Muslim town. This is the name of the name of the king.